Talon reached for a scroll sitting on his desk. He was in his room in Manor du Couteau. Talon's skills did not lie in scholarly pursuits like research or magic. Heck, he didn't even know how to read until General du Couteau had him taught after taking him in. He did, however, know how to get information out of people. He was thankful General du Couteau had spared the resources to teach him to read, or he would not have found this scroll useful. Now he was going to take everything General du Couteau had given him and use it to find him. The Search for General du Couteau By, Rune Katashima Words, 21,985 Converted to audiobook by, a random audiobook appeared. Talon was equipped in his standard Noxian uniform that he usually wore when he went to perform business. Bladed cloak and hood, purple and blue outfit, and countless blades and daggers. It was night time now, Katarina should be asleep. He didn't inform her as to what he was doing tonight, but she already knew what he had been doing every night since the general's disappearance. Cassiopeia had already been drawn into his search, but he never included Cot. She had her own way of doing things. He opened the door to his room out into the hallway. He had not taken more than two steps before being greeted by a drop kick from Katarina herself. She saw her feet connect with Talon, she felt her feet connect with Talon, so why was he still, still behind her with a blade at her throat? It didn't surprise her, but she still wondered. They had both become accustomed to this type of relationship. Long ago when General Ducouteau took Talon in, Katarina despised him. He was nothing but a street rat, why should he be allowed to walk the immaculate hallways of Manor Ducouteau? It was just her, and her sister. They didn't need some dirty boy. She saw it as an infestation in the house and she treated him like it. Always chiding and berating him, yet Talon had never complained. He worked his ass off in service of the general. He stood silent at everything caught through at him. She was, at the time, a spoiled brat. Eventually Katerina learned the blade, and she had known that her father took Talon in because of the duel they had. Her father won though, so she surmised he couldn't be that impressive. She understood so little. After a few months of training she had challenged Talon. If she bested him, she wagered that Talon had to be her slave for a month. Talon wagered nothing back. Which had pissed her off. When Katerina engaged Talon he beat her into a submission she would never forget. He walked off silently as she lay on her back, staring at the blue sky. It was then that she understood why her father had let riffraff like him into her home. Katerina almost cried. Almost. Of the less than five times in her life that she had cried, including when she was a baby, she didn't count this one. She wanted her father to pay attention to her, she wanted to show how far she had come. She thought by beating Talon she would show how they didn't need him. How worthless this street rat was. She was wrong and she hated it. It would drive Katerina to be the kind of deadly woman she was today. Right now though, Talon had bested her again. 746 to 3 now, is it? He chided as he released her. Katerina turned to face Talon as he pushed her off. She furrowed her brow, scrunched up her lips, but looked away a second later. She blew at a strand of her hair and said, 747 to 5. I'm not counting the time you grabbed old maid Teresa and used her as a human shield. Talon paused, she retired after that you know. His arms were crossed now. He was almost lecturing her, though he knew it would do no good. Though he did wonder where he won an extra match at. Or the time you grabbed Jean's puppy from down the street and chucked it at me. Completely unfair. This made her laugh a little. Not my fault you liked the darn little critter. She began mocking the diving action Talon had taken that day, but he had already turned and soundlessly started walking down the hall. Hey. I'm not finished with you yet. She yelled at him, bald fist in the air. She walked after him at a quicker pace than he was going, but they both stopped before he left the manor. Just where are you leaving to at 2300 at night? There aren't any orders for us. None that need doing right now anyway. She spoke far more calmly now than she did 15 seconds ago. She didn't need the answer, but she wanted to ask. She always butted into his business, for as long as they had been around each other. She saw the scroll, but didn't care to ask about it. Talon turned his head a few degrees to the left so she could see a small portion of his face. Oh, you know? The only business that needs doing. With that Talon swept his hood on top of his head and swiftly left the house. She knew already, but she always asked. He didn't think she worried about him, but was probably more looking for answers about her father's disappearance. 
Cassiopeia slithered out from around a corner, wearing just a pajama top. She was rubbing her eyes as she said, Sister, why must you two make such a racket at this hour? Katerina puffed at a lock of hair, then moseyed it off to her room, Nothing sister. Get your beauty sleep. Cassiopeia gave a half-hearted hiss back as a retort before returning to her room as well. Talon's preferred method of travel by night in Noxus was by rooftop, as he deftly jumped from one to another. It avoided all manner of unsavory types that crawled the streets of Noxus when dusk fell. Never mind that Talon himself was one of those unsavory types, he preferred to not have a conflict every fifteen feet, especially when he was conducting business. His destination was a bar in the Ebony Ward. Always open, and open to all but the most uncouth of individuals. His contact would be there. During his passage through the Crimson Ward, he passed by Darius. Talon stopped on a rooftop corner in a crouched position. Darius' back was turned to him, but he knew Talon was there, and Talon knew that. Darius was staring off into the distance of Noxus. He was on night watch. Talon. Darius. On night watch I see. Careful, watch the night long enough, and the night starts watching you back. Darius smirked, Ha, huh, since when were you capable of jokes, assassin? Since jokes were truth, hand of Noxus. Darius was of course, all too aware of the goings-on of Noxus, especially at night. It was one of maybe two things he and Talon had in common. Their struggle from the bottom. They weren't friends, but they weren't enemies. They would have conversations like this whenever they ran into each other in Noxus, usually chiding the other's job occupation. Darius turned his neck a sparse few degrees, Were you going all dressed to kill, in the middle of the night? Talon turned his head away from Darius and back before responding, Isn't night the most opportune time? Besides, since when was my business any concern of yours? Darius turned his head back, How many blades do you carry under that damned cloak of yours anyway, twenty-six? Twenty-seven. No you don't. No, I don't. You know that's, Darius had done a full turn to address Talon, but he was gone. Darius turned back with a scoff, mumbling to himself, I hate it when he does that. A few minutes later Talon arrived at the steaming hot cup of stew foo. Talon thought the name was stupid, but he didn't get it. He didn't take many steps in when he saw his party waving to him. Hey, hey, Talon. Gragas waved a large hand that could have encompassed the entirety of Talon's head. Talon walked calmly over and pulled his chair out, but sat in it in reverse. He laid his arms across the back of the chair and clasped his hands together, facing Gragas. A waiter walked over to take Talon's order but Talon shook his head at them. Boy, you'll not be getting very much from me if you can't share a drink with me. Said Gragas, jubilantly. Talon sighed and signaled for two things off the menu. He didn't bring gold, it jingled, but luckily they ran a tab at this place. The things he ordered were rather simple, a plate of fries and a beer. Gragas gave him a squinting glare. I work nights, can't be fat and wasted on the job. Talon reasoned. Now it was Gragas' turn to sigh. Fair enough, but next time I'm in, you owe me a drink. Talon nodded in response. So what do you have for me? Gragas asked after their fries and alcohol had arrived and they had cut into both a bit. Talon pulled out the scroll he had been keeping within his cloak, safe from any snatchers. He rolled it out for Gragas to see. I know this isn't your particular area of expertise but you told me in our correspondence that you might know someone who would be. As you know after I've acquired some recent contacts and a string of unfortunate accidents I happened across this scroll just floating on a body in the moat. Gragas coughed and Talon pretended not to notice. Basically, I've been led to this scroll, and I can't decipher its script. There are plenty of lore masters in Valoran, but even I know that the script isn't what is important here. It's the magic used to write the script. I need this traced. From what I gather, it's a set of rules designed to start something when all the requirements are met. What intrigues me is that General Marcus Ducuto's name is part of the script. I can't make out the rest of it though, seems the runes couldn't replace names. Talon finished. Gragas gave a strong, hum with his hand upon his chin, as if contemplating the matter, but it was clear this was beyond him. All right, well then, looks like you got yourself a bag o' kittens. Talon's face scrunched up at the awkward phrase. This all, goes way, way over my head, but, I know a lad that can help ya. Gragas reached into a pouch and pulled out a slip of paper with writing on it. Name's Thanis, simple lad, deals in books, but he'll be able to help ya out. 
Tha paper has his address. Just tell him I sent you. He owes me a thing or two. Gragas paused and smiled. Now you owe me one. Ha <laughs> ha. Gragas started chuckling a bit, but cut himself off. Not enough booze yet. The night was too young for him. Thanks Gragas. Talon said, reaching a hand out to him. Don't mention. Gragas shook his hand but coughed a bit. Food down the wrong pipe. Talon grabbed a handful of fries as he made his way out and crammed them into his mouth as he left. Gragas had done the same, but with way more. A-N-F-U-F-G-H-N-H-N-F-N-N-H-N-H-H-N-N-H. Gragas said pointing at his fries and turning to Talon who had already gone, mouth overflowing with fries and other food. Talon arrived in the Cerulean ward around 0200 in the morning. This place was rather safe compared to the rest of Noxus. Not quite like the Ivory Ward though. The slip had given him the address and let him know that Thanos would still be awake and waiting for him. Apparently Gragas had preemptively spoken with Thanos informing him about what was going on. So Talon simply knocked on the door instead of any fancy shenanigans. Thanos answered the door swiftly and after unlocking several locks. He was younger and shorter than Talon, barely an adult. Most noticeably his hair was a bright blonde and he looked quite frail. Talon wondered how he had survived in Noxus this long, but then immediately decided he had come from money. Ah, uh, you must be the assassin, uh, uh, Talon. Thanos spoke nervously. Talon gave him an odd look, but nodded. Thanos opened the door wider for him to come in. Talon may have been upset about Gragas being such a big mouth but his own reputation had gained quite a bit of notoriety as of late. Mostly his own fault. It was not really a secret any longer that Talon existed and he was good at what he did. The place was packed with books, but this wasn't the boy's store. He just seemed to be really big into reading. Thanos felt a little stereotypical. Weak, nerd boy. Thanos showed Talon into his study. I understand you have a scroll for me to decipher. Not exactly. Talon went on to explain what he had explained to Gragas as well as the overall situation with General Dukuto. Thanos was left pondering much in the same manner Gragas was. After a while he nodded to himself and reached out his hand. May I see it? Won't really get anywhere without it, right? Thanos presented a weak smile. Talon eyed him curiously as he reached into his cloak and pulled out the scroll, handing it to Thanos, who immediately spread it out along a canvas to examine it as it was much larger than an average page of text. Talon couldn't help but wonder why a bookworm who owned a store would willingly be up so late at night to help someone he never met who, by all accounts, was incredibly dangerous. Talon voiced his concerns, Why are you up so late at night, to help someone like me? Thanos merely replied with a smile and said, Because Gragas said you were an alright guy and that's enough for me. How do you know Gragas? Asked Talon. He's kind of my foster father. He adopted me when I was orphaned as just a babe. Saved me from the streets he did. He didn't directly take care of me, but he was responsible for my safe upbringing. Thanos spoke without looking at Talon, still examining the scroll he brought with him. Talon could see Thanos thought fondly of Gragas. Why didn't he send you directly to me though? Asked Thanos. He wanted a drinking buddy of course. Talon replied. Doesn't that man have enough drinking buddies by now? Talon laughed in response, you're either underestimating that man's constitution or overestimating everyone else's. Thanos chuckled in response. Yeah, I guess. For a while there was silence between them, then Talon interrupted the silence, How long will this take? Thanos scratched the back of his head but didn't really take his eyes off the scroll. Uh, several hours. A vein twitched in Talon's skull. You should probably go home and get some rest. I'll send the results to you in the mail sometime today. Talon shook his head. That won't do, can't run the risk of interception and I don't really want to leave my lead behind so easily. I'll stay here until you're done. Talon was adamant about this decision, he had spent far too much time on dead leads and lost ones. Thanos shrugged. Suit yourself. Make yourself comfortable while you're here then. Talon did. He took a seat in the next room. It was a comfortable chair. Too comfortable. Talon's eyelids grew heavy and he soon fell asleep. Talon was no stranger to long nights, but he had already had a long night before he started this one. Katarina attacked Talon again, this time from behind. 
as if that would have made the odds more in her favor over the last twenty times where she attacked from the front. It ended the same. She was on her back and Talon kept walking. He was even carrying wood this time. Wood. For what purpose? It wasn't like they were short on firewood. Their house was a comfort zone, all their needs taken care of by her father and his servants. It had been a full year since their first duel. If it could be called that. Katerina had already been taken under the wing of her father's hand-picked trainers to learn the blade, to learn to kill. Yet still, she could not best Talon. She wagered Talon could have killed all of them if he found it necessary. She blew a lock of hair out of her face, got up, and caught up to Talon. As she met his stride, how do you do it? Talon did not even meet her gaze. How do I do what? Beat me every time. Katerina had not yet acquired her voracity, she was still young and curious. Because you suck. She threw a fist at him and Talon blocked it with his piece of wood, which made her hand hurt. She stood there for a moment in pain, her hand smarting. Talon had already kept walking, you suck. He repeated. She flung a blade at him, which he blocked with his piece of wood again, the blade sticking out of it. Teach me. Katerina blurted out. What? Talon's disbelief was palpable. Katerina's hand was still outstretched from having flung the dagger. Teach me. How to kill. Teach me the pain the Noxus gutter taught you. Talon smiled at her and pulled out the dagger in the wood. Holding both in either hand, he pointed with the blade and said, This way. Talon woke up, startled from some noise. The morning dawn was just breaking but he didn't have the time or the care for it. The noise gave him a feeling in his gut he did not like. His room was isolated and when he reached for the door it was locked. It was a strange thing but he managed not to think about it as he slammed his body against it, destroying the lock as he burst through. His dread confirmed, Thanos was lying in a pool of blood and the scroll was gone, but not far. He could see the one who took it taking to the rooftops. An egregious error, this was Talon's turf. Now it was time to play Talon's game. Talon leaped out of the window with all due haste. The thief and would-be assassin didn't even know of Talon's presence before or now until he saw him come from the side across from another building, blades flying towards him, raking the shingles. A chill ran down his spine, but he knew enough to dodge the blades, which cut a weather vane short. The chase began. The thief was quick and he put some distance between himself and Talon. After a while, when he no longer had eyes on Talon, he dropped down between two buildings. He likely didn't see it and it would be difficult to find him in the growing crowds. The thief caught his breath for a moment, and checked his surroundings. Nothing. He turned a corner to exit the alleyway. Hi. There was Talon and there was his blood spilling over his blade from his throat. The thief gurgled as he crumpled to the floor, twitching and convulsing as his life leaked out from him. Talon sighed and thrust his blade definitively into the man, taking away his precious last few moments. Mercy. He did not enjoy the suffering of others. Just that their death was ensured was all he needed. Talon reached down and took the stolen scroll. He noted that Thanos had done his job and left a letter that the thief also had. It was already painfully obvious that this man was hired to steal the work. The letter undoubtedly had all the information Thanos had gleaned from the scroll for Talon. There was a little bit of blood on it though. He couldn't tell if it was the thief's or Thanos. So help him though if it stopped him from gaining information or he would have to stab the thief's corpse a few more times until he felt better. Darius had arrived on the scene. Talon. I'd say I'm surprised to see you here, but I'd be lying. Darius paused for a moment as he surveyed the scene. I don't suppose this was the business you had to attend to last night? Darius asked, his hand outstretched to indicate the new addition to the Noxus moat. Not quite, Darius. Talon said, not meeting his gaze, instead staring at the letter. This man stole from me and I... Rectified the situation. He said, just now turning to Darius. Your proof. Darius said, kneeling down to check the body. Little that I care to give, but he killed a man not too long ago. I'm sure the weapon he used is on him. Here's the address for him. Talon did not hand the slip to Darius, but simply dropped it near him. The slip weaved through the air but Darius caught it before it passed his shoulder. Darius sighed, and I almost had a quiet watch. There was a slight noise behind him, but Darius didn't bother turning, it was just the sound of Talon leaving.
Talon walked quietly through the door to the general's main study. He was currently perusing a map, a book, documents. Many things. Talon noticed but tried not to. He stood quietly at attention in the general's office for a while, no shared conversation between either of them. It was often like this. The general would call him in and he'd stand there like a fool for a time before Marcus said or did anything to address him. Eventually the general sat in his seat with a sigh and a noticeable puff of air leaving his comfy chair as he did. He looked a little stressed, something that was not a common occurrence with him. His fingers were pressed lightly to his right temple, before he motioned them minimally in Talon's direction. Talon! The general addressed him. You called for me, sir. Talon responded calmly. The general sat forward in his seat, slightly hunched over the table, fingers pressed together. A servant tells me that they have seen you and Katerina sneaking off at night. Going somewhere. At this, the general stood up and glided his left hand over his desk as he began to walk around it. Talon knew better than to deny it, lying to the old man was impossible and tantamount to suicide. The general probably wouldn't kill him for lying, but there were worse things. Instead, Talon remained silent. The general noticed this and continued on as if nothing amiss, it didn't bother him, he had more details to elaborate on anyway. They tell me they've seen it more than once. I am inclined to believe this has been going on for some time, has it not? The general's gaze now leveled malevolently with Talon's. Talon merely gave a curt nod in affirmation. Their eyes were locked and Talon felt a wave of fear crawl down his skin. The general was on him in an instant, grabbing him by the throat, a mere thumb pressed into his trachea, crushing it slowly. He slammed Talon against the wall with no small amount of strength. So help me, by the fury of Noxus, I will flay you alive where you are boy. If you took my daughter's chastity death will seem like a sweet gift. The general was livid. Talon responded with choked gasps, but he did not raise his hands to attempt to remove his attacker's hand from his throat. At that moment Katerina burst into the room, not five feet from them. She was wearing her training gear having just finished some lessons. She had heard the commotion as she was headed on up toward her room for a shower. Father! What are you doing? Katerina exclaimed. Her expression was distraught, she looked to Talon and back to her father. Tell me Cot, did this boy sully you? When she didn't immediately respond. Did he? At first Katerina merely raised an eyebrow at her father. It all clicked for her, and she started giggling uncontrollably. With this street rat? She thumped towards Talon. Not a chance. As the general's grip lessened Talon managed a breath and a chuckle of his own. They both started laughing together and the general let go of Talon completely, but he was still befuddled. Then why were you and Talon sneaking off in the night together? He questioned, gesturing his arms in puzzlement toward her. Oh that? P-H-H-B-B-B-T. She flapped her wrist at him. I convinced Talon to teach me how to use a blade. Katerina explained. Convinced? The general raised an eyebrow. She managed a kick at her father, who blocked it. Not like that. Dirty old man. She raged at him. But why? Are my teachers not enough? He responded. It's not that dad, they're great, actually. However, I've challenged Talon many times now and he's beaten me every time. He knows some things I don't. One day. Dad. You won't be here. I cannot accept not being the one to fill your shoes when that day comes. Talon is a means to an end. And that end is being the best dem-assassin in Valoran. She clenched her fist as she finished saying this. Both men in the room smiled at her, for her. And. Maybe while you're here I want to impress you some too. Talon walked into one of the few manors in the Crimson District. The reason for this one being here was almost like a pun. He did not walk in invited, but acted like it. He scaled a wall, ignoring the heavily guarded front gate and walked calmly across the lawn and leapt up to a window that he easily breached. As he walked into the dining room, a figure at the far end sighed loudly, I hate it when you do that. Don't you know how to use a door? Vladimir said, swishing around a glass of wine. Maybe when you get windows that aren't so easy to get past that actually don't happen to be more convenient than walking through your door, sure. I suppose I'll have to then. Talon was referring to the guards Vladimir kept posted and the heavy double doors that led into his residence. Among other things, like the dogs. Vladimir was capable of defending himself as a blood mage, but it was more trouble than it was worth. Plus, this way kept up appearances. What are you here for? 
Vladimir took a sip from his wine glass. Talon walked to his end of the table and tossed the envelope across the table to him, letting it slide some. Vladimir picked it up, immediately noting the blood on it, his eyes squinted at it. He let it rest back down on his glass long table. Drink! Vladimir asked, pouring another glass. Please! The assassin said, raising his hand in acceptance and taking a seat. Vladimir handed him a glass, retook a seat, and began examining the envelope. Talon didn't need to tell Vlad what he needed him for, they had begun this relationship quite some time ago. Vladimir's talents as a blood mage allowed him to see into the memories of the blood as if he were that person for hours before it left its host. Usually, this allowed Talon to track down a target, exactly what he was hoping for this time. They didn't trade in currency, rather Vlad owed him a permanent favor. Many years back Talon was sent to kill Vlad, instead Vlad convinced him to kill his contractor. Had Talon been sent by General Dukuto he'd have killed Vlad, but Talon had taken a personal contract and didn't care for his employer. As Vlad entered a trance Talon heard the delicate sound of bare feet and a dress gliding along the floor. She had entered the room out of the corner of his eyes. Talon figured it was another of his toys as Vlad was something of a playboy. She approached behind him and grey arms wrapped sensually around his neck reaching down to his chest. She let out a soft coup as two soft protrusions pressed against the back of his head and his body went ice cold. Morgana. He finished his sip and slowly set his glass back down on the table. Talon was uneasy around living, intelligent things he couldn't kill. Even if she couldn't kill him now she could orchestrate his demise with infinite time. She caressed his face as she sauntered away. The mistress of pain is being unusually gentle. What's the matter Talon? You went rigid as soon as I touched you. Are you afraid of me? She smiled at him as she arrived at Vlad's side. It was then Talon realized who the toy was here. He supposed it was a match made in heaven with these two. A sparse, awkward, silent moment passed between them before Vlad came out of it. He set the envelope back down and said, The Black Rose in a very business-like manner. Vlad already had some connections in the Black Rose, so this was rather convenient. Talon nodded and got up from his chair intending to leave. Wait, Talon dear, you forgot your letter. Morgana grabbed the letter and held it up for him. He merely half turned before Vlad interjected, he doesn't need it. Talon smirked at him and left the building in silence the same way he came in. Morgana looked at Vlad perplexed, her confusion would go unanswered. It was all a setup, by Talon himself. Four months before they had been receiving ransom letters and various other mail claiming they had or knew the whereabouts of Marcus Ducuto. Unfortunately, they had all been goose chases or elaborate traps. All of which Talon pursued without Katarina's knowledge. He intercepted all such mail before anyone else could see it. However he had noticed that some of this mail had been tampered with, intercepted before he even got it. There was information out there, someone was trying to reach out to the Dukuto family with legitimate information on the location of the head of the family and it was being altered to stop them. So he devised a plan to have a fake coded letter sent to them regarding the general. Whoever intercepted the mail would not be able to decode it, it was gibberish. Neither could Thanis, as Morgana found out when she tore open the envelope, frustrated. He knew though that they wouldn't allow Talon to read a deciphered message. The entire fiasco with the would-be thief was planned, minus Thanis' death, but that didn't largely concern him. The leader of the Black Rose had not been seen for some time. In fact, their very existence was largely unknown to the population. To those who knew, they seemed to disappear into obscurity or oblivion for quite some time. Even fewer knew of their resurgence. Talon was only scarcely aware but he had no relations with them or any kind of interaction. If anything he considered them enemies, especially now. He knew next to nothing about them though, so he would have to find someone who did. Talon had passed the rest of the day in relative normalcy. He had arranged for a horse to take him to Demacia the next day. He stayed in the manor and ate a steak dinner. He saw Cassiopeia briefly but did not see Katerina all day. Talon stored his equipment away and left his assassin's outfit with the maids. Every day they were cleaned for him and ready the next morning. He laid down in a soft, queen-sized bed. When Talon came to live with the general he insisted on giving him a more comfortable lifestyle than what the street gave him despite the fact that he just tried to kill him. The general did not go out to take his life, he went out because he knew he was the only one who could do it, and because he saw potential in the boy. He couldn't just let such fine talent stay on the streets. When he was a teenager Talon was introduced to the same room. And this will be your room. The maid said as she let him in. 
she fell silent and stayed to the side of the door to lessen her presence. He looked into the space, it was everything he wanted as a child and it disgusted him. His life had been the opposite of this, staying here was a crime to who he was. I'm not staying here. He abruptly said and turned around. Marcus was standing in the doorway, his two daughters were standing behind him. It had been the first time he had seen them. In truth he had not been around girls much as a street rat. These are my two daughters, Katerina and Cassiopeia. I hope that you will treat them like your sisters, they're only a little younger than you. Aside from one butler and myself you are the only man in the house. Marcus started explaining as he walked into the room. He was aware of Talon's protest but pretended not to have heard. We have a regular security detail on the perimeter as well. If someone were to get inside the house I am relying on you to protect them as I would. I won't always be here. At the mention of their names the two girls waved shyly at Talon. He could see the effects of a privileged lifestyle on them. When the general entered the room he remembered what he owed the man, staying here were his orders, protecting these girls and treating them like sisters were his orders. The Ducuto family was his family now, and he would give his life for them were it so necessary. Talon had one contact in Demacia, at least for meeting peacefully with other members of Demacian society. It was hard maintaining any assassin contractors in Demacia as they would usually be rooted out and summarily executed with haste, so he had few and sometimes none of those. This contact was important though and not likely to be executed any time soon. A fair length of time ago they had met on a field of battle and neither could truly best the other. Instead of killing each other they traded names and now they trade favors instead of blood. The ride to Demacia was fairly uneventful. He was able to ride on the road as normal and stopped at inns for a rest when he had to until he got within Damasian territory. The trip took three times longer because he had to stay off the roads and his inns were now caves and forests. This was because Talon's face was now well known to the Damasian military and he didn't really feel like killing every patrol he came across. Talon wasn't a murderer, when he killed it was for business and nothing more. Talon hitched his horse a mile out from the Damasian city walls. Talon brought with him basic equipment and an extra outfit for when he was inside the walls that would allow him to blend in. It was night now and guards were more alert than in the daytime. He chose to rest instead of scaling the walls the hard way. He could do it but it was unnecessary, his daytime method was much easier and his quarry was probably asleep right now anyway. Which was normally a boon, but not this time. When morning came Talon packed his belongings away into his horse's saddlebags and changed into something more befitting someone who resides within Demacia. He still had a choice number of blades on him, he always did, but he was considerably less armed. His signature blade that mounted his arm would have to remain behind for now. Talon loitered along the road into Demacia approximately a mile out until a choice carriage revealed itself to him. And it was merely loose hay and it was being hauled into Demacia and there was no one around with eyes on it. Talon nonchalantly walked up to the carriage and hopped in as softly as he could so that the driver didn't notice. Talon then proceeded to conceal himself as best as possible within the hay. The ride would be agonizingly slow but he'd get into Demacia with relatively no effort. The cart entered without a hitch past the front gate guards. Once inside he listened at the hustle and bustle of the city, when it got quiet he risked a peek out and when he caught a moment to exit without being seen he took it. Talon jumped from his carriage onto a cobbled road, and none too sooner as a group of passerby would have noticed his odd departure in a few moments. Thus, was Talon in Demacia with Neri but a twig of hay on his shoulder. Simple, if slow. From this it was a simple matter of blending in with crowds and groups while making his way to his destination. He couldn't simply run the rooftops like he did in Noxus or he might get spotted. The the whole town guard would be on alert for a very long time. He could not expect to blend into a crowd at that point and get away with it. A half hour passed without alerting a single guard when he arrived at a luxurious and beautiful manor, surrounded on all sides by well-tended grass. Flowers hung off the sides and hanging pots. The facade was hewn marble, but the shingles and windows were as black as a raven's feathers. An aesthetic point courtesy of the current head of household, he knew. There were no guards posted at the entrance or on the property itself. The owner invited all challengers at any time and felt that the town guards were more than enough to discourage riffraff as they seldom had trouble anyway. Talon calmly walked up to the door with a hand in his pocket and rapped on it with the back of his hand. There was an engraving above the door, House Laron. To anyone else it would be a surprise that the owner would answer the door, but Talon knew that Fiora Laron would answer the door herself. She had ever since she issued that challenge. During her last dueling tournament a man who was to be her opponent proposed to her, claiming her beauty and grace with the sword only matched by the woman who wielded it. 
she was hardly flattered as the duel, and the tournament, ended in her favor. Since then she publicly issued a challenge to all comers for her hand. If they wanted to put a ring on it they'd have to knock the blade out of it first. Fiora Laurent answered the door with a blade in hand. She was dressed in a practical outfit, though it was a black and white dress, it allowed freedom of movement. It had various ruffles along the skirt and at her wrists and collar. It was also dotted. Her collar came to a v-neck and the dress exposed her legs and the fact that she wore nothing for her feet. It was apparent though, that she might have been about to sit down to have lunch or tea. It was the latter. Ah, Talon. How nice of you to drop by. Fiora looked both ways out the door then hauled him in. Fiora shut the door behind him, how did you get here? She only half cared, she knew how he'd answer. The same way I always do. Which wasn't entirely true. Talon had numerous ways to break into Demacia. Ch, I wish you would tell me. It would be nice to cover our weaknesses. Fiora said as she strolled down the hall with Talon in tow. Talon sighed, you know if I did that, it'd be much harder to get in. His sigh transforming into a light smile. He truly did enjoy their banter. Perhaps it was just her presence. Fiora smiled and answered curtly, I'm sure you would find a way. Yes, but then you would ask about that way too. Talon countered. They had arrived at a small tea table on a patio that looked out onto a vast field of grass on her property. Body marble pillars lined up to hold the weight of the, the outcropping of the floors above. Fiora turned to Talon, gingerly holding her weapon's blade in her left hand, held in the right. You're toying with me. Talon smirked and Fiora laughed as they sat down. Fiora's maids brought her tea and brought Talon his choice of coffee. He had been here before and though they didn't know him to be the deadly assassin he is, they knew what his favorite cup of coffee was. They exchanged sips and a few crumpet bites before Fiora broke the pleasant silence. So, what brings you here this time, Talon? Your delicious coffee. Talon replied as he took another sip. Fiora's face contorted into her that's bullshit look, paused for a moment, then leaned in, but really. General Ducuto Talon interrupted. For a brief moment Fiora attempted to read Talon before responding. Oh, the usual then. Fiora sat back in her seat and Talon scoffed, it's not like that. I have a real lead this time. Mm millimeter Fiora hummed, raising her eyebrows and taking another sip of her tea looking thoroughly unimpressed. You should get a real hobby, Talon. Don't you have a girlfriend? Fiora poked at him from across the table. Not at the moment. Talon paused while Fiora took another sip. What about Katerina? There are rumors about you too. Fiora countered. All untrue. Whatever they are. She's basically my sister. I'm not like that. Talon shook his head. Are you into men? Fiora joked. Talon merely glared at her question, which prompted her to laugh. Just teasing, darling, just teasing. Fiora hummed a little while they both shared another sip. What was that one girl's name? Fiora pondered for a moment. Ah, Riven. Talon suddenly choked a bit on his coffee. Fiora had a mischievous grin on her face. Oh. Did I hit a vital? Talon composed himself and set down his cup. That was a long time ago. We were friends. Just friends. Fiora replied curtly. Talon remained silent. Fiora gave a disappointed whimper and leaned back in her seat. After a brief moment of silence she asked, Do you two still talk? Talon, who had intertwined his fingers in his lap looked up at her. Yes, actually. Fiora perked up. Even after she um... Abandoned Noxus? Isn't that punishable by death in your country? Heh, yes, well. Just as much it is here. At this, Fiora gave an affirmative shrug. We exchange letters and she uses a code name so she doesn't get caught. She tells me about her travels. Talon drifted off into his own thoughts. I see. You want to travel like she does. In a way, yes. It would be nice to be unbound by Noxian rule. Talon replied, leaning forward having brought his intertwined hands up to his mouth. Then why don't you? You're here now. You could escape just as easily as she did. Fiora pressed on, assessing his motivations. Talon waved the thought off. I don't stick with Noxus because I love Noxus. I owe General Kuto my life. If nothing else, I want to find him. 
Then, maybe then. Talon placed his locked together hands on the table. It was clear that his thoughts had drifted off to possibilities he did not yet want to consider. That is why I like you Talon. I find myself not having an overwhelming love for my country as the Crown Guards do, but at the same time I would prefer not to see my friends hurt. Which is why I'm still here and why I'm going to help you again. I can imagine it. Nobody should go through that pain of losing a friend. She reached across the table and held Talon's hands in hers. They were strong, he probably didn't need consoling, but she was there to offer it. They had finished their tea and coffee and moved on to why he was actually there. She had ordered her maid to bring her a few documents. When she arrived with them she looked them over and handed a few over to Talon. You're looking for the Black Rose? Talk to Vane. She's been tracking them and investigating their movements for as long as I've known her. She probably won't try to kill you. Probably. Talon gave her an unpleasant expression. Here. She's not in Demacier right now, which should be good for you. That paper will tell you how to find her. She's off on some sort of... Demon hunt or something. Fiora, satisfied she had done her part to help, leaned back in her chair after handing him a few documents with a content look on her face. Talon placed all the papers she gave him into his vest pocket. Thank you Fiora, this means a lot to me and... The maid came in and curtsied. Lady Laron, Quinn is here to see you. At that very moment without hesitation Talon reached across the table and grabbed Fiora by her collar. The maid cried out, in fear. Talon pulled out a blade and held it to Fiora's throat. That very instant Quinn and her bird Valor arrived, crossbow drawn. She had expected a normal meeting, but was equipped as a soldier. When she heard the maid scream, she rushed forward with Valor and drew her hand crossbow. Noxian scum! Quinn shouted angrily. She fired a bolt where he was, but Talon had released Fiora and leapt across the table by pushing off from his chair and the table rolling onto the ground on the other side. Quinn's bolt tore through his chair, utterly destroying it. Talon got to his feet quickly. He couldn't fight Quinn here. He was less than optimally armed and it would look bad if Fiora didn't help Quinn. He'd have to fight the two of them and the situation would just turn worse. So he ran. After him Valor. Valor replied with a loud call and gave chase. Talon weaved through the pillars of the Laron estate holding up the second floor. He slung his blades at Quinn and Valor as they gave chase, discouraging them from gaining too much ground. He leapt onto the railing and jumped from there to grab onto the facade of the house. Grabbing onto whatever would hold him, he climbed up the side of the house. Only Valor could chase him now and he wasn't as deadly as Quinn. He figured Quinn wouldn't be as good at climbing as he was. On the roof of Laron Manor he saw no sign of his pursuers but for a brief moment. A hail of bolts came raining down, one slicing up his leg and another finding its mark in his shoulder. Quinn came with the bolts, she landed from the sky with Valor's aid. Talon flung his blades as she landed, nailing her legs, she fell to the ground temporarily crippled. He rushed her and tackled her to the ground, but instead used her as a vault to leap right by her. Valor! Her bird gave chase again as Talon ran to the edge of the roof. He sent out eight blades in a ringed fashion and he disappeared from sight. Valor stopped giving chase and flew high into the sky. If he stayed low the blades could kill him and there was nowhere else he could see better. A few seconds later the blades suddenly converged on a location far in the distance on the ground. Valor considered giving chase for a moment but Quinn called him back. We'll get him next time old friend, for now, at least Lady Laron is safe. When Quinn arrived at ground level she made her way to encounter Fiora. Lady Laron, are you hurt? Quinn's voice trembling with genuine concern. No, you fool. Do you know how much these chairs cost? Fiora gestured to her chair that was now ruined. Wood was splintered and the fabric was unsalvageable. Fiora continued making a big deal about it, all the while causing Quinn to feel sad and guilty. Fiora was hiding the fact that there was a second cup at her table very well. Fiora and a contingent of soldiers were patrolling a Demacian forest not far from the city itself. They were currently on an oft-used trail on the premise that there had been bandit attacks along its length. They weren't disguising themselves, simply having a show of force to discourage any further attempts. The path they were on was well-traveled and the trees on either side were well-distanced from the path itself. They had come to a partial clearing with a grassy hill and dirt ledge on their left ascended well above their height when the attack began. Men in dark clothing burst from the forest, blades being thrown as they closed the distance to her troops who were three dozen in number. Her immediate thought was that they had the advantage in number, their enemy showed hardly a dozen but she couldn't tell what else lied in the shadows of the forest. 
she didn't think such a small group would dare attack a well-armed Damasian troop. A few of her men fell in the initial ambush but they grouped together and counter-attacked. Fiora attempted to join the fray but her soldiers were preventing her from getting too involved. Protect the Grand Duelist! A captain proclaimed. Fiora answered by pushing him aside, you're in my way. She dashed through her ranks to the enemy. She could easily handle at least two opponents of this caliber at once. She parried an attack and dodged another from her left and sliced her enemy's throat open. Her flanks and rear guarded by her troop, they constantly maneuvered to surround her from getting swarmed by too many. They steadily moved forward in combat and that was when Fiora noticed their mistake. Another dozen arrived at the top of the ledge and began raining down arrows and blades upon her contingent. Two of her men fell where they stood right next to her. Several projectiles were aimed at her but she blocked all of them and began making her way through her dying platoon. She called a few enemies on the outskirts and the men on the ledge descended down to her level. She felt it was foolish but perhaps they ran out of ammo. Her men still held the advantage in skill and equipment, but each group was down to only several members. She stood in the middle of her group, confident of her superior position and commanded forth, Lay down your arms and you will not be slain. You will receive Damasian mercy and stand trial. Before she could continue a strong arm wrapped itself around her neck with a blade pressing against her tender neck and another at her backside. Her men turned around toward her and began encircling her, joining ranks with that of their ambushers. It was in that moment that Fiora recognized her attackers, Noxians. They didn't wear the traditional battle garb of Noxians but there was no mistaking upon closer inspection immediately out of the heat of battle. At least their outfits were definitely Noxian inspired. Demacian mercy is no mercy at all. Her captor responded and pushed his blade a little more firmly into her back. The blade hurt, but not as much as her pride. She felt betrayed at first, but quickly realized her own troop was filled with Noxians from the start. That's what hurt her so much, that she didn't notice. Fiora's mind raced, she didn't know what was going to happen to her. She was disarmed, sword on the ground, and surrounded. Would she be killed or held for ransom? Tears began welling in her eyes. Pathetic! was the call to her predicament. Blades larger than the ones she had seen in the conflict darted out from the forest and instantly slayed three men, one wearing the Damasian garb, before returning from whence they came just as quickly. She could feel her captor tense up but before anything could happen he slacked very suddenly. Her rescuer had descended from a tree above onto him, driving a blade through his spine, ending his life instantly. Their opponents were shocked for a brief moment, four of their allies were slain before anyone could react, but they saw him now and they quickly stepped forth to end his threat. Talon picked her sword up as he swept forward, tossing it to her, fight, was all he said as he met the enemy in combat. Fiora didn't hesitate. Hesitation is not how she acquired the title of Grand Duelist. The moment the handle of her blade touched the palm of her hand she grasped it as if it were always meant to be there and immediately dispatched the closest target to her by stabbing him through the throat before his guard came up. Fiora waltzed through the enemy in a maneuver that could only be described as elegant as it was fierce. Her opponents could not keep up with her, slashing at her as she would suddenly be on the other side of their arm cutting through them and immediately moving on to the next opponent as fluidly as the wind. Talon threw blades with an accuracy rivaled by heart surgeons, never hitting Fiora but always cutting off an opponent's attack and never letting them get close to him. Before her waltz finished he fired out a ring of blades in a perfect radius, ending the lives of two enemies and claiming three more on their immediate return. Fiora was impressed at how artfully he stole her kills and somehow managed to not hurt her in the process. At that though, she wondered why the Noxian assassin chose to not kill her along with the rest, and namely his own troops among them. Was this not the perfect opportunity? Fiora's heart was pounding rapidly and she was a little out of breath. Talon didn't seem to have exerted himself at all. She took a moment to walk it off, noting the amount of dead bodies on the ground. She was very nearly among them. When she cooled down she took a seat with her back to the carnage so she didn't have to look at it. Death itself wasn't what bothered her but simply her near scrape with it, combined with the emotions she felt at her failure and the loss of good soldiers under her command. Some of those who turned on her she had known for months. It overwhelmed her that Noxus could have sleeper agents like that in Demacia. She looked up at her temporary savior who was currently cleaning the blood off his signature blade. He had not said anything more and did not leave for some reason. Why did you let me live? She addressed him without actually looking at him. She stared at the ground, her multicolored pink and black bangs covering her face. After a brief moment involving Talon sharpening his blade he turned to her, You're too valuable to die at the moment. Her expression changed to utter incredulity. Ha! 
Like I'm supposed to believe the famed Noxian assassin, Talon, went out of his way to save a Demacian noble girl in trouble? You would gain much by letting them have my head. She left her next obvious question hang in the air. Talon shrugged in response. It was just coincidental we crossed paths. I've been tracking these deserters for a while. I was assigned to end them. You happen to be here. Nothing more. Talon responded in his usual malevolent cold tone. Fiora seemed miffed at his nonchalant response. She didn't believe him. So blasé, Talon. You still could have killed me or allowed them to kill me and accomplished your goal. Talon's response was quick and firm. I wasn't assigned to kill you. So I haven't. As for why I didn't let them finish you. Talon paused for a moment. I simply don't like waiting. He grinned at her. Fiora raised her eyebrow at him, her expression matching his. Fiora stood up. In the name of Demacia, she knew she should challenge him here and now. It would not behoove her to let him get away, and yet she sustained severe damage during that conflict. She surmised that although it was possible to win, she chose to not take a fight so out of her favor. Furthermore, it wouldn't be very honorable. I think you're full of it. She said as she crossed her arms, rapier still in hand. Talon chuckled quietly to himself and turned his back to her. You're a rose without thorns, Fiora. Ha! Watch yourself or I might quickly grow some and stab you with them. She relaxed her posture and Talon walked off, disappearing into the forest. Fiora waited there for a long time, but he never came back out. She sighed to herself as she began the long walk back to Demacia. When Fiora returned she would begin her first of many lies she would perform for Talon. A few days had passed and Talon had already entered the area where Vane was presumed to be. Given that she was on a hunt it was to be expected that she wouldn't be staying in one place, so he had to find her. It was in between the Howling Marsh and the Iron Spike Mountains he found a camp. The camp was deserted but he figured she would have to be nearby. When night fell he felt that he was being pursued through the darkness. Talon took to hiding among some trees while he waited for his pursuer to lose his path. A quarter of an hour passed when Talon heard a voice in the darkness. Looking for me, assassin. The voice was female, it was vain. He could not ascertain where she was though. You've sat in the comfort of Noxian walls too long, assassin. Here, in the darkness of the Howling Marsh I am the hunter of hunters. She heard the crack of a branch above her as Talon descended upon her. She tumbled away instantly into an upright position pointing her crossbow at where he fell, but he was not there. It was then that she realized she was surrounded by floating blades when Talon called out to her, You merely pursue the darkness, Vane. I was born in it. Talon began with a malevolent tone, but with a brief pause, finished calmly. What are you babbling about? Vane scoffed. You don't do jokes, do you? Talon's blades harmlessly passed her as they returned to their owner, who emerged out of the darkness in front of her. Normally, she'd have put a bolt into his heart but she understood the situation the moment the blades didn't try to kill her. Knowing that, she raised her crossbow and relaxed. It's night time, why are you still wearing glasses? Vane pushed her glasses up by the corner with one finger without responding. Talon decided it was best not to care, so he decided to cut to the chase. Fiora sent me, I'm looking for the Black Rose and I need your assistance. Ha! Huh. That's rich. What's next? You're going to ask me to help you find the grocery store. Vane quipped. Talon growled at her. Oh my, you're serious aren't you? Vane hefted her crossbow down into her arms. If anything I would have loved to question you about them, given that they're based in your city. Yes, I am aware, but I've never personally had any contact with them. Vane adjusted her glasses again. Fiora sent you then. Vane pondered to herself for a moment. Very well. I think I know some things that could be of use to you. I'm not going to tell you for free, however. Talon grimaced, he didn't have any money on him. How much? Not money, dear. You're going to help me slay a demon. Vane said with a slight smirk on her face. Talon nearly keeled over. This was not his calling. His agony was palpable. Vane could only laugh in response. What's the matter, scared? Talon shot her a menacing stare that reminded her where he grew up. Oh, right. Vane trailed off, but Talon interjected before she could finish her thought aloud. I just don't like fighting non-humans. Sometimes their skin is like armor and even cutting their throat doesn't always mean the end of it. 
Well, if it makes you feel any better I've already wounded the dem thing. It got away though and I lost my trail when you showed up. Couldn't risk fighting two opponents. Vane's tone sounding very accusatory. So you're going to help me then? Talon brandished his blade, looking into its sheen in the darkness. My blade is getting a little too shiny. Vane grinned in response. Let's go. Talon and Vane crept through the darkness of the Howling Marsh. They had never worked together before and likely never would again, but even though they were both used to solo work they moved in tandem, like a squad of two. Talon deferred to her judgment, she was the one tracking the demon after all. It was long before they came abreast of the Iron Spike Mountains. Vane adjusted her glasses again before speaking, looks like our mark entered the cave up ahead. You ready for this? Absolutely not. Talon replied. Vane chuckled to herself as she went in, Talon following several steps behind. The cave, as Talon expected, was cramped. It had enough room for one of them to maneuver but he wondered what would happen when the fighting started. When blades and crossbow bolts started being slung around along with who knows what the demon would have at its disposal it would be hard to avoid getting hit at all. A faint dripping sound could be heard in the cave, its origin utterly unknown but it echoed through the cave as if it were omnipresent. It was constant, but Talon found comfort in it. He used it to gauge against the sounds of their own steps, the swish of their cloth, to determine if anything that was not them moved in the blackness. Talon was waiting for his eyes to adjust but they never did. He raised his blade's hand in front of him, to what he swore was mere inches from his face, and yet he could not see it. If he looked down he couldn't see his own body. He followed Vane through the mere sound of her footsteps, something he was particularly skilled at doing. Talon could feel them going underground, deep beneath the mountain. The slight downward sloping of the path gave it away. After several minutes Vane came to a halt. He sensed her stop but he still reached out with a bare hand and touched her shoulder. She didn't flinch and he could tell it was definitely her frame. Vane turned at the waist to Talon though he could not tell. We're at a clearing, I think we've come to the demon's abode. She whispered to him. Talon nodded, unaware if she saw it or not. Talon thought she might be nervous, she was breathing heavily. Who knew what her encounter with it was like before he had arrived? They both knew without saying to be extra cautious and quiet from here on out. It seemed that Vane could see in this pitch blackness. Talon wondered to himself if it was her glasses. It was the only thing that made sense to him. Talon made a mental note of it. Just in case. Talon followed closely behind Vane, it seemed they were circling the clearing, using the leftmost wall as a bearing. He repeatedly brushed up against what seemed like stalagmites all across the cave. Vane made no indication that she had found her quarry. They had reached a large rock formation jutting out of the ground when Vane leaned her weight against it with one arm. You know, it's going to be really difficult sneaking up on the bastard with you breathing so heavily. At this, Talon's heart caught in his throat. The breathing noise had stopped when she finished speaking but not while she was speaking. Talon grabbed her cape at the shoulder and heaved her away as Vane's mind arrived a second late to the party. From behind her a large mop had taken a bite out of the rock she was just at, trying to devour her in the process. It roared in anger when it realized its food had eluded itself. Talon heard the crunching of a rock as they split up, Vane having used the momentum Talon threw her with to roll gracefully away. Did it just eat stone? Talon voiced with utter incredulity. It's from the void, they eat everything. Vane's voice in a mix between near panic and anger. Vane raised her crossbow at the demon. It was at least twice her height and much wider. Courtesy of typical void creatures it was colorful and had spikes that seemed necessary everywhere and redundant lines of teeth. The head and mouth always seemed as large as the body itself, with eyes too small compared to everything else. Vane fired a bolt into the beast, one would not be enough to slay it but the bolt she fired illuminated the creature so Talon could see it. Having been in the darkness for a while it hurt his eyes for a moment but it wasn't particularly blinding, the light was soft and did not reach very far. The creature roared at her and buried itself into the rock beneath their feet. Vane, not missing a beat, fired a few more bolts into her surroundings, lighting the place up. Talon was impressed with her, she was tactical enough to bring these specialized bolts along and fire them into the scenery in such a way that illuminated only the large open areas, but not the small spaces in between stalagmites and rocks where they, being small humans, could fit through. Vane fired another bolt into the ceiling with a line attached to it. She unhooked it from her bow and tossed the end to Talon. Talon, here. Talon caught the end and he didn't need to question its purpose, as it was immediately apparent when he felt the rumbling beneath his feet. The earth surged up along with the maw of this worm-like beast covered in chitinous plating. 
Before the creature's jaw consumed him, he pressed the button on the line which shot him up into the air at a rapid pace, but the creature's momentum carried itself at nearly the same pace. If he didn't do something it would surely devour him. Enjoy the taste of steel. Talon tossed two blades out and tucked his legs in as the creature's jaw snapped shut in reaction. One blade dragged along the creature's hide and got stuck in between two scales and the other found its mark in its fleshy mouth. When the creature shut its trap Talon wondered if he'd ever see that blade again. Be purged by silver! Vane cried out. She began firing bolts into the beast's flesh wherever she could find it. She didn't move when it turned its attention to her after failing to capture Talon. The creature lunged at her attempting to catch her within its maw, having no hands or feet to manipulate with. Vane rolled to the side last second, seemingly having supernatural prediction of its movements and continued firing point-blank bolts into its head. The creature was not yet felled however, and thrashed its head around, violently knocking Vane into a rock, causing her to momentarily slump to the ground. The creature was having difficulty turning towards her and by the time it did she had recovered. It rose up on its tail, preparing to lunge at her. Vane jumped onto the rock when it did and boosted off of it to get enough height to jump off the creature's head to avoid further injury. The creature used its momentum to turn to Vane, but Talon had enough. He had been observing the creature for some time. He descended from the ceiling like a bird of prey and jammed his signature blade at the base of the skull. It slid out of its flesh with a sickly noise, covered in its vile blood. The void beast let out a high-pitched cry, but it was not done yet. Let's finish this! Talon called out. He momentarily grasped onto a scale as the creature reared and he rolled off when he felt the moment was right. Vane grinned and pulled her large crossbow out. Time for your reckoning! Vane fired a large bolt into the creature's abdomen and sent it flying into a wall, pinning it there. The creature struggled and flailed, but did not die, nor could it escape. Talon! Vane addressed, lifting her crossbow. He understood, tipping his hood to her he walked over to the beast and finished it off by slicing it across the middle and stepping back to avoid the spray. Its entrails spilled out onto the floor and yet it still struggled for a brief moment, but shortly went limp and silent. Vane pushed her chest out and held her chin high with a slight grin. You sure you're not cut out for this? Talon shook his head in response. Not interested. Vane relaxed and walked over to the creature. She grasped the body of her bolt and with effort, pulled it out. The creature fell to the floor like a doll and splashed in its own fluids. Talon followed over and reached into the creature's mouth. Vane raised an eyebrow at him as he worked his hand around in the mass of flesh. Talon pulled out the blade he lost to its maw, covered in its goo. This blade's my favorite. Vane only groaned in response to his cheesiness as she gathered the illuminating bolts on the rocks and made to leave. Over an hour later they had left the Iron Spike Mountains and the Howling Marsh onto regular flat lands where the only threats were fairly normal fauna and the odd human. Vane set up a new camp using the materials she picked up from her last camp. You should rest here. I imagine you'll be heading back to Noxus after this and that's a fair trip from here. She said as she laid out a mat. Careful Vane, it almost sounds like you care. Talon replied. Vane stared at him for a long moment completely vacant of emotion. Ugh, never mind. He continued as he pressed his index and thumb against the bridge of his nose. Before they slept Vane shared everything she knew about the Black Rose. From members she confirmed and suspected to a pattern leading to possible locations of their base. From their activities to their recruitment and supply lines. Talon was able to cross-reference much of what she said with what he knew of Noxus. Its layout in relation to their activities and how the Noxian elite were surely involved. The more Vane talked the more Talon became disgusted with the Black Rose and the closer he felt to finding the general. Vane had pegged Swain as a member or an affiliate, but she couldn't be sure. When they lied down Vane asked, Talon. You're a member of Noxus and an assassin at that. Why have you helped Demacia? She remained partially upright for the question. I've done nothing to help Demacia. I came to you because I have my own mission and you had information I needed, nothing more. Talon curtly responded with his back to her. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Fiora. I don't think she would have just sent you my way because you asked nicely. Vane leaned back before continuing. So you had to have helped her at some point? Talon sighed. Allegiances mean nothing to me. Talon rolled over and started on his way to sleep. Vane thought to herself. I guess that's why. You're more alike than either of you know. When morning came Vane was already gone. She had left a note for him. It only had a name on it. Emilie LeBlanc. Boy, boy. Talon. Talon. 
one of Talon's old street rat friends hailed him as he was walking down the street in the Ivory District. Talon had only been in Dukuto's service for a few months now, but he felt like his old street rat life was far behind him. Even now, he was running an errand for his new master. His friend crossed the street and grabbed him by the arm. Talon, we really need your help. This girl is beating everyone. His friend exclaimed. A girl? Seriously? Talon doubted. This guy would consider him a friend, Talon considered him as more of a contact and a guy he did a job or two with. He already knew what he was talking about though, those on the streets sometimes wagered themselves or what they earned in contests. It's probably something stupid, like arm wrestling. Talon thought. It was arm wrestling. Talon, thoroughly unimpressed, looked into the crowd. She even challenged Darius, but he refused her. His former associate's enthusiasm had not died down one bit. Hmm, Darius refused her. Talon's interest stirred, but he still didn't feel obligated to be here. He's pretty strong, but why do you need me? Come on man, we can't let a girl take all our stuff, win it back for us. He pleaded. Talon's only response was a disapproving growl. What's in it for me? Why should I pick up after you? His escort took a few steps away from him. Hey, hey. I'll talk to the guys about giving you a share of the spoils. There's a lot. It's all our stuff. Talon was coerced. It's not like he could stiff him and they both knew it. Fine, but learn the lesson to not underestimate your opponent. Talon walked off from him, pushing through the crowd to reach the table where they were currently wrestling. He arrived just in time to see her put another man to the ground, near effortlessly. She smiled as she collected her winnings. Reaching across the table and sliding it all to her with both arms like some kind of hoarder. There was some gold but also a few knickknacks. She looked up at him as Talon parted the crowd into the clearing. Are you to be my next opponent? It was more of a challenge than a question. Talon's heart skipped a beat. Her expression was fierce. She was attractive but he could immediately sense how deadly she was. It wasn't that he was scared to meet her in a dark alley. No, that was reserved for himself. Talon had immediately decided that, barring this meeting, to never get on her bad side. Talon calmly took his seat opposite of her. What's your wager? She prompted him. Stoically, Talon pointed to her earnings and in a stone-cold tone said, All of it. She began laughing. All of it? Do you know how many of these creeps I had to go through to get all of this? You can't possibly have something worth. She was caught off guard as Talon hefted a sack onto the table, then unbuckled a sword from his hip and also laid it, very carefully, onto the table. Talon parted the top of the sack so she could see all the gold carried inside. She pointed to the sword, unsheathe it. Talon carefully pulled the sword out of the sheath and with all the respect of a connoisseur handled it with care as he presented it to her. She reached for it, don't touch. He demanded. Chills ran through her from his command. She had never felt that way before. It's... The craftsmanship is beautiful. Where did you acquire such a blade? Talon silently sheathed the blade and rebuckled it to his hip and secured the gold as well. He told her nothing, but extended his arm. I see, so it's like that. She reached forward with her right and they grasped hands. Like Talon before, her heart skipped a beat. He was strong, that was for sure, whether he was as strong as Draven wasn't clear. It was the determination in his eyes, the resolve, and the darkness, that made her catch her breath in her throat. She smiled, a worthy opponent. The two reached under their hands with their off-dominant and clutched each other there as well. A makeshift referee came over and gave them a countdown. Three. Two. One. Go. At the call, the two immediately tensed up as all of their strength were being put into each other. Their grips were firm and for the first few moments, not an inch was given on either side. Their expressions remained unchanged but unlike her other opponents their eyes remained locked. Too many of them, even Draven, focused on the arms waging war. Perhaps that was why they lost. Not much sound passed between them other than the slight muffled grunt. After a brief moment the table began to shake, their hands were quickly shaking back and forth in their struggle. Both of their expressions started to become intense. The crowd was hyped and they were all screaming, making bets, and cheering. It was just background noise to them. For the next few seconds they belonged to their own little world. 
In the end, it wasn't strength alone that determined the outcome, but Talon's resolve, as he put her arm down. He laid back in his chair, chest heaving. She, however, looked downtrodden as she lay with her cheek against the table and her arm laying where it was defeated. Moments later the winnings had been traded. Talon expected them to count it up in their favor, and they did. He took his share and went on his way, but it wasn't long before the girl he defeated caught up with him a short distance down the street. She had caught her breath and recovered her spirit. Talon stopped as she approached, waiting for her to say something. Just who are you? Was not quite what he was expecting. Talon considered for a moment before he tipped the bill of his hood, just a shadow, ma'am, and continued walking. She wasn't pleased with that answer and instead opted to walk alongside him. That's not a name, tough guy, as she reached around his neck to give him a headlock and prevent his continued gait. A mistake for her to remember, he instantly grabbed her arm and flipped her over, where she landed on the ground on her back. Talon pulled a blade on her, less than an inch from the tender alcove of her esophagus. They both went wide-eyed. He immediately pulled her up and began apologizing profusely, noticing she didn't actually mean him harm. Sometimes he forgot to shut it off. It had only been a few months since he was really off the street. She didn't run away though. She just looked downtrodden again. Her eyes cast elsewhere. Saying sorry among many other things wasn't what he needed to tell her. The edge of his mouth twitched, the name's Talon. She turned to meet his gaze again. He could see her spirit slowly recovering again. She reached out a hand to him, Riven. She smiled and he smiled back. In unspoken words they agreed to continue to walk down the street together. So that sword? Riven pressed nonchalantly. It's General Ducuto's. Ah, that makes sense. She paused, it's beautiful work. After thinking for a brief moment she queried him, but what are you doing with it? He smirked with a raised eyebrow and caught half her gaze noticing she was looking at him intently. She was definitely taller than the other girls their age and she seemed very near to his age, though Talon was still slightly taller than her. I killed him and took it as my prize. An obvious lie, they both knew. She laughed and that made him feel warm, different than the last time she laughed. Hum, but in truth. She inquired further with an innocent tone, raising her index finger. The other side of his mouth twitched this time. I recently became his dog and now I'm running an errand for him involving this sword. He paused for a moment, considering if he should tell her. He wants it enchanted, so that's what I'm doing. Taking it to get it enchanted. He said flatly. Oh, but doesn't he have people for that? Riven countered. He offered his hand as a weight in the conversation. Yes, but technically I am one of those people. She responded with a sound of acknowledgement from her throat. They continued down the street and to Vexalian Square with small talk. Eventually Talon got his work done, but she didn't leave even as afternoon just passed. Why are you following me? It was Talon's turn to inquire. Because you're strong. Talon raised an eyebrow at that but said nothing. They passed by a sandwich stand where Talon bought two meals. He handed them to her asking her to hold on to them. Their small talk ended and they walked for a time in silence before Talon broke it. They had arrived at an older bell tower. Want to see something cool? He grinned at her and before she could answer he made a small leap up and grasped onto a ledge. Hanging by one hand a few feet off the ground he posited to her, race you. She grinned right back to him. You're crazy. But he could see the fire in her as she dashed into the tower and started running up the steps. Ha! He began ascending the tower, deftly grasping each handhold. Riven reached the top, still holding onto the handbags. Talon was there, sitting on a ledge. He smirked at her, what took you so long? She scoffed at him. Come off it, you barely got there. Perhaps. He responded as he hefted himself off the ledge and took a bag from her. He crossed past her and hefted the bag onto the roof and then himself, then he reached down for her hand. Come on. Her smile had not faded as she hefted her own bag onto the roof and grabbed his hand. He swung her up to join him. They sat on the roof together eating the sandwich subs Talon bought for themselves. Afternoon was passing and the sun was setting. Riven was the first to break the silence that encroached upon them, mouth still filled with food. I want to get stronger. It was more like a thought spoken aloud than a conversation starter. 
you're plenty strong as it is Riven. Talon casually answered, before taking another bite. Riven shook her head in response. Swallowing her food. You beat me, that's not acceptable. Darius probably would have beaten me too. She let silence fill the air again after her statement. That's expected. Darius is strong because he has to be. Look at his loud-mouthed brother, always getting into trouble and too small to back it up. But Darius is always there for him. Talon reasoned, not having continued his meal. Riven chuckled a bit to herself. Yeah, that kid will probably always be a nobody. His brother, though, will probably be a general someday. She mused, thinking aloud of the future. Probably. Talon added. Hey, Talon. Hmm. You're in the military, right? Talon stretched with an audible grunt before responding. Yeah, what of it? Riven chomped down on the last of her sub before continuing, I'm going to join too. Talon raised an eyebrow at her. What for? That strength, she gestured towards Talon, this moment. That strength that we've developed as children of Noxus. The kind of strength Darius has to protect his brother. The strength that you have shown me. I want to share Noxian strength with the world. Our heritage was rough, but we earned our right to be here. Riven had stood up near the end of her speech and faced Talon, the sunset at her back, her fist was clenched tightly over her heart and she closed her eyes and let her thoughts sink in and permeate the air between them. Talon could only respond by laughing, but before Riven could get offended he said, You look like a hero. She smiled warmly at him and approached him. She got on both of her knees with one of her legs between Talon's and pressed her lips to his. Talon wasn't expecting it, but he didn't deny it. His arms were supporting his weight and her arms were braced against his neck and chest. The kiss lasted for a solid moment before she broke it. She smiled at him in a way that could forge his heart of cold steel into a weapon. Riven stood up and approached the edge of the roof. Looking back she asked, I'll see you again, yeah? To which Talon nodded. At that she walked off the edge and slid down the wall, jumping off near the end to reduce her impact on the ground. She had impressed Talon. Apparently he wasn't the only dweller of high places. But there is no honor in Noxus. Talon mused to himself aloud. He pressed two fingers to his lips and thought, Did I just make a girlfriend? After a few days, Talon made it home. Katerina was waiting for him on the couch with her arms draped across the back, looking as sinister as ever. She had heard news of his arrival. So where have you been? She shot at him the moment he crossed the threshold. Talon grimaced at her attitude, none of your business. He fired back before stomping up the stairs. She flung a dagger that embedded itself in the wall in front of his face, clearly not an actual attempt to hurt him, but get his attention. Katerina sashayed over to the railing and placed her arms across it and underneath her chin which she rested upon them. One half of her hair fell over to Talon's side of the railing, the other lay against her back as she leaned over. You should know by now Talon. Everything in Noxus is my business. Her statement was laced with conviction and a touch of violence. Humph, fine. Talon continued with an air of confidence. I believe I may have found those responsible for your father's disappearance. What? Katerina straightened up immediately and stomped her way onto the same steps Talon was on. She grabbed him by the collar and slammed him against the wall. Talon did not defend against this, he just let it happen. And you were just going to walk off on your own knowing this and not sharing anything. Katerina grimaced. Cassiopeia appeared at the top of the steps having apparently left her room having heard the commotion. Fighting again? I swear I'm going to turn the both of you to stone for a full day. Cassiopeia interjected. Talon pushed Katerina off him with one hand and plopped down onto one of the steps. He buried his face into his left hand. He had been to lands far and wide searching for General Kuto and the answer may have been sitting under Noxus all this time. How long had he been doing this alone? Leaving Katerina and Cassiopeia blissfully unawares. The stress was beginning to get to him, but he was finally so close. Katerina put a dagger underneath his chin and raised it up, forcing Talon to stand. Cassiopeia embraced him from behind. You don't have to do everything by yourself anymore. Cassiopeia hissed into his ear. Katerina relinquished her blade, after all, we're family, right? And what does family do when one has a problem? 
Cassiopeia continued releasing her hold on Talon and slithering to the floor beneath them. Katerina pumped her fists together, we kill the crap out of it. Katerina looked far more psyched than the other two. Cassiopeia put a hand to her her head and sighed to herself at Katerina's action. Talon just laughed at her. Katerina ended his laugh with a gut punch. That's for implying my father isn't my business. Talon keeled a little before saying, noted. After Talon recovered he continued, I haven't had a decent rest yet. When I get up I'll fill you both in. Talon ascended the stairs to take to his room. And what are we supposed to do in the meantime? Katerina asked into the ceiling above her. Sharpen your blades, Talon replied, then after a brief moment, and your fangs. Cassiopeia gleefully hissed in response. Noon came and Talon had awoken. Talon bathed the smell of the road off of him before getting back into his assassin attire. A new set, the previous was set out with his sheets for the maids to take care of. When Talon descended the stairs Katerina and Cassiopeia were waiting there as if they had never left. You know that was the most boring five hours of my life. Katerina feigned. You tell me to sharpen my blades like we're going to kill something and then go to sleep. It's the most anticlimactic thing ever. I'm sure there's something you could have done. Don't you have someone to bully other than me? Katerina glared at him, but Cassiopeia interjected. She's only fooling with you Talon. She's only been waiting about an hour. We ate. Among other things. Cassiopeia smacked Katerina upside her head, sparking a small response from her. They all relaxed and Talon began filling them in on what had occurred over the past two weeks. Chiefly, his suspicions about the Black Rose and their involvement. Talon produced a map he used to cross-reference with what Vane told him about their activities. We think they're based under the mountain, but there's no direct route there. There are entrances to the underground all over the city. Meaning they can also leave anywhere. We'd have to go through one of the underground passages to reach the inner sanctum. Luckily I'm familiar with the underground. Talon explained. How is this? I've been living here all my life and I've not once stumbled across these underground passages. You're telling me they've been there all this time and that you are familiar with them. Katerina was stupefied. Of course. I practically lived in them as a child. I haven't used them since Dukuto took me in, but I can't imagine they've changed. Just that they're actually inhabited now. Talon said. They were not when you were little. Cassiopeia inquired. No I used the underground passages daily and I never encountered another soul down there. It was only a few years though. They must have been inactive until recently. Talon replied. Hey, didn't you say Vane mentioned Swain as a member of the Black Rose? Said Katerina. Yes, but, before he continued Katerina's next revelation already hit him. What's happened in the past few years? Father disappears. Swain is inducted as Lieutenant General. Dark Will turns up dead, then the whole Kalamanda incident and Swain is promoted to High General of Noxus. Katerina paused as a terrifically malefic chill coursed through each of them. The bastard has had his hands in everything. Katerina inferred. Talon felt like he should have known, but most of all Talon really felt the urge to stab something. So he stood up and began towards the door. Cassiopeia tugged on his cloak before he was out of reach. If Swain is responsible for all of this, are we just going to storm High Command? Her voice filled with trepidation. No, first thing is first. Dukuto is the priority here, as much as I want to put a blade into those responsible. Swain doesn't sit with the Black Rose, so it's more likely LeBlanc would know their plans. How long has he been waiting for us? Talon asked to no one in particular. Well, I'd say it's about time to get talk killing, don't you big guy? Katerina said as she stood up next to him and put a hand on his shoulder. Nightfall was upon them. Talon led them to a well in the Azure district. He gestured for them to jump in and as they did so he kept a lookout until his turn came when he leapt in. With a splash, he roughly fell 15 feet. Instead of a well bottom, Katerina and Cassiopeia were greeted with a passage that simply had water at soul level. Is this it? Katerina exclaimed disappointed. No. We go deeper. Talon answered. The trio descended beneath Noxus, guided by a cobblestone passage and the faint sound of running water. Whenever they came to a fork Talon seemed to know which way to head right away. 
They passed through a makeshift door and a proper door and the passageways seemed to become more refined the closer they got to the Black Rose's sanctum. It wasn't long then before they started coming across other people. Talon halted them with a motion of his arm before they alerted them to their presence. The only people who would be down here other than them were Black Rose members. There were two, but Talon already knew how to handle them. The simplest of tasks. Talon darted around the corner and flung a blade at his unsuspecting victim. The blade landed at the base of his neck and he crumpled to the ground, his companion turned toward where the blade had come from but Talon had charged down the passageway and leaped into him, driving his blade into the man's heart in between his ribcage. Katerina nonchalantly approached him from behind with her fists on her hips. Pfft, show off. Next ones are mine. They continued on for a few minutes before coming across any other foes. As claimed it was Katerina's turn. These were another duo who seemed to be guarding a fork. Katerina ran down the hall with absolutely no tact. The guards charged her, weapons drawn. Katerina performed a rolling jump over their swords and embedded two daggers in each of their throats as she passed by. She landed deftly on her feet, her momentum bringing them both to the ground. Talon now did the same to Katerina. Pointing at himself he said, and I'm the show-off. Talon was utterly incredulous. Can't have you showing me up. Katerina said as she stood up, flipping her bangs out of her eyes with her left hand. Can't be far now, right? She continued in a more serious tone. We're almost there. Talon replied. True to his word they arrived at a large door. It was inconspicuously inscribed with the Black Rose's insignia. I guess at this point they stopped caring. Cassiopeia offered. Talon nodded his head in agreement. I've never been past here. This insignia was not always here. Talon finished his statement with a firm push. The door had no give. He gestured to the others, help me out here. Katerina only huffed in response, but she and Cassiopeia gave in and pushed against it. When that didn't work the three of them gave it their all. The door did not budge. It won't open with force. Talon stated his confusion. Katerina was frustrated. Without warning she shunpo it into the door with a powerful kick. The door budged open in response. Ha! Huh. You see? Clearly, we weren't using enough violence. We should have brought explosives. Katerina exclaimed. Cassiopeia pondered aloud, I'm no sister. I think it merely responded to your magic. Shut up, you're ruining the fun. Katerina retorted. Talon ignored them and pushed the heavy doors further for them to walk through. What they entered was a room that any of them could have mistaken for a room in the Witherwood Academy. It was dark and musty, lit only by candlelight. Katerina surmised that only some gloomy person could feel like they were home in this. There were bookshelves but also a lot of tables and chairs. It looked like a place for people to congregate. All three of them heard voices as they took a few steps into the chamber. Talon and Katerina disappeared simultaneously, leaving Cassiopeia alone. She didn't seem bothered though as she continued through the chamber, eventually reaching an open space with a long table. LeBlanc sat at the head of it. She seemed to be discussing ideas with other members there. She abruptly halted when she noticed someone she knew not to be a member had entered the room. Ah, and what brings you here, slithering one? LeBlanc uttered coyly. She didn't even bother moving from her chair, but casually rested her cheek on her knuckles. Oh you know, just taking in the sights, wondering where this infernal catacomb leads to, trying to find out who erased my father from the Noxus elite. Small stuff. Cassiopeia replied with hinted malice. LeBlanc continued acting coy with a smile, so you've decided to come here, however you found this place, alone. What do you hope to accomplish? LeBlanc didn't bother denying she had a hand in Cassiopeia's father's disappearance. If she was here under that pretense lies weren't about to misdirect her. Well I thought I might like to see you in pain. Writhing in agony beneath me. My venom sapping your strength and your senses. Cassiopeia continued like they had just been chatting about the weather. At this the people present at Leblanc's table rose. She made no move to stop them. They all wore dark garments. The Black Rose did not have uniforms, uniforms were identifying, but they tended toward darker clothing. Some wielded staves and other swords. They had the potential to overwhelm Cassiopeia but she had her own aces of course. The Black Rose members began to surround her, of course she let them. One placed himself in between her and LeBlanc, raising a sword to her throat. Cassiopeia neither budged nor flinched. If you tell me what you've done with my father I'll let you and your... 
People leave here with their lives. Cassiopeia said lightly pressing on the threatening sword. LeBlanc wasn't buying it. She was figuring out something was up. Cassiopeia may have become a sinister opponent since becoming a Gorgon but LeBlanc knew she didn't have the fortitude for this kind of work. This was something more up the alley of her sister. Her sister didn't have the finesse for this kind of thing either though. Cassiopeia could speak but it wasn't in her to be ruthless like Katerina. She also knew Cassiopeia was not that dumb to come by herself, or to even find this place on her own. For that she needed. It hit LeBlanc all at once. She rose from her seat, but before she could utter a command a blade arrived at her throat. Cassiopeia turned the man in front of her to stone. Katerina appeared from the darkness behind Cassiopeia. She flung two blades to Cassiopeia's sides, each hitting their target and bouncing to the next in line. Faster than any could react she shunpoed to the first foe hit, the first dagger having not even left the third person's body, she shunpoed from the first to the second whirling her blades as she did so, killing each combatant on the spot before they had a chance to harm her or her sister. Cassiopeia turned and hurled miasma and poison at the remaining enemies. They attempted to close the distance on her but she was too quick, keeping just out of their range, her poison working to slow them. They died slowly, stubbornly, and Cassiopeia sped up the process by driving her twin fangs into each of them in rapid succession. In nearly no time, all of Leblanc's combatants lay dead around her. When all was done eight bodies lay on the ground and the three of them stood triumphant over Leblanc. Cassiopeia calmly slid over to Leblanc and Katerina sheathed her bloody daggers crossing over to the other side of the table. Now, dear Emilia, you're going to tell us what you've done with the general. Or I swear to make this as unpleasant as possible. Talon dragged his blade underneath her chin, releasing a steady stream of bright red blood. His other forearm gripped her tightly across the chest. Leblanc would have thought that it hurt if that was Leblanc in Talon's grasp. With nothing more than a puff of smoke and the telltale sound of Leblanc's laughter there was no longer anyone in his arms and Leblanc was nowhere to be found. Poor puppy! All lost without his master! Leblanc teased, her voice echoed in the chamber, making it hard if not impossible to determine her location. Talon grimaced from having fallen for such a cheap trick. Right where I want them! LeBlanc dashed from one bookcase to another, firing a magic bolt at them. They were all able to dodge it, but it occurred to them that they were the sitting ducks. She harassed them like this a few more times before a couple bolts found their marks, injuring Katerina and Cassiopeia. LeBlanc's laughter from the shadows was irritating at best. They resolved to enter the unknown maze of bookcases to hunt her down. They knew it worked to her advantage to split up but it was their best chance to catch the slippery femme fatale. Cassiopeia being a slithering serpent wasn't much of a climber and couldn't really make leaps. Talon was the best climber but Katerina would have the easiest time jumping from bookcase to bookcase, so she took the high route while the other two stayed on the ground. Talon was the first to encounter LeBlanc, or at least a clone of her. He caught sight of her running behind a bookshelf and immediately lashed out with his blades, tearing through the books and the shelves. The blades caught their target who didn't seem to make a move to evade, and it puffed away into smoke. Talon was only mildly aggravated after all, he had expected this. More than one mirage showed up on the top of the bookcases, but one was the real deal. Katerina could tell because she occasionally felt pain when they attacked her. Unfortunately for LeBlanc the entire Ducuto family were the worst to trick with fake copies. All of them were exceptionally skilled at throwing blades at multiple targets. Katerina had had enough and she shunpoed into the middle of every LeBlanc she saw and spun a deadly dance of blades throwing daggers rapidly at each Amelia LeBlanc that she could see. Three dissipated and two daggers found their mark in the real LeBlanc. LeBlanc, however was not defeated and Katerina, while spinning, wasn't otherwise moving. LeBlanc cast forth magical chains that caught Katerina immediately. In seconds the chains wrapped themselves around her and started binding her painfully. LeBlanc smirked to herself as she distorted towards Katerina, leaving behind a launch pad she could return to. She had set Katerina up with a sigil of malice beforehand. This might not kill her but it was going to take her out of the fight, making it easier to deal with the other two. Or that would be the case if Cassiopeia wasn't directly beneath them. All it took was Cass' scream for LeBlanc to make the mistake of looking down for a moment and suddenly Cassiopeia turned her to stone in mid-air. Katerina broke free of the chains above and LeBlanc fell as any stone statue of herself would. Luckily, both Talon and Cassiopeia were available to catch her before she fell to the ground and shattered. In a mere moment the stone flesh wore off and LeBlanc was in Talon and Cass' arms, but she just smiled sheepishly at Cassiopeia who breathed sweet miasma into her face. LeBlanc wretched and gave her a look of disgust before she distorted back from her launch pad. LeBlanc laughed at her adversaries before coughing unceremoniously during it due to Cassiopeia's poison. 
LeBlanc grimaced and attempted to mimic her distortion spell to dash away to a further bookcase, prolonging the chase, but Katerina was up now. She crouched low through a dagger at LeBlanc, catching her in the leg. She fell on top of the bookcase she dashed to, crippled. Talon's shoulder charged it, knocking her down once again. He didn't bother catching her this time. He could have, but he didn't. Katerina stood up and tossed her hair with her hand, with an additional arrogant flick of her head. Thank God that's over. She proclaimed. The other two silently agreed and LeBlanc passed into unconsciousness. So you're leaving, is that it? Katerina's voice shook with anger. She had acquired her scar over her eye now and her crimson tresses were the longest they'd ever been. They had recently received word that her father had gone missing and search efforts had finally ceased, declaring the man effectively dead to Noxus. One way or the other. This was all Talon needed to know to reclaim his freedom. He packed a minimum of things and decided to leave Noxus, never to return. Two things were stopping him though. Katerina and himself. One was more obstinate than the other. And pissed. Katerina had changed. She finished her training and had finally become a real Noxian assassin. She quickly acquired the moniker, the Sinister Blade. She was overconfident and haughty and that earned her the scar over her eye. It humbled her and made her all the more vicious at the same time. Then her father disappeared, igniting her passion for violence to unheard of levels. She, just as Talon did, believed him to be alive and she swore death upon those that caused this. Talon was less concerned. Move, caught. As he, with his things, stood at the front door, ready to leave. Screw you. Talon dropped his things and forcefully moved her out of the way. Katerina expected this, however, and grabbed his arm twisting it behind his back and moved to shove him against the wall. Talon instead ran along the wall and flipped over her. She drew her blades but Talon did not draw his, despite the fact that they were both battle equipped. She threw a blade at him and he sidestepped it. She spun around and attempted to cut him with her dagger on a backspin. He dodged that too. He noticed she was playing for keeps this time. One misstep and she'd end him. When she came back around her other dagger was poised to strike from overhand, but he finally drew up his blade and blocked it. She brought up her other blade to stab him and but he grabbed the hand controlling that blade with his free hand. They were locked together, faces inches from each other. You would abandon him now? At the time he needs us most, when he gave you this life. She sputtered at him. I am no longer bound to him, Katerina. All I've wanted is my freedom. He knew this. He angrily replied through gritted teeth. They thrust each other away but Katerina immediately moved back on the offensive. She lunged with one of her signature daggers to cross his chest, expecting him to block it, she had used the momentum and the opening provided to strike him. Instead, he knocked the attack down with an open hand and used her momentum to pull her into him with her neck in his arms. Normally this is when he'd break it for an enemy or in a spar he'd end it, instead he flipped her over him and into a wood and glass display case holding various sorts of expensive dinnerware. The display was shattered and crushed, but her resolve was not. Talon let go when he flung her, but they both got back up and he was not expecting her to land a haymaker on his face. She followed it up with a gut punch while holding onto his hood. She tried delivering a knee to his chest but he blocked it with both hands, followed by breaking her hold by exploding with force using both arms to break her hold. She was prepared for this though and grabbed his hands as they raised up and jumped into the air using his arms as leverage and drop kicked him in the face. She landed as deftly as a cat and quickly delivered a roundhouse to his torso before he could recover, sending Talon flying into a painting of her parents before she was born. The two of them were huffing and puffing. Katerina washed her hands of the situation, you're nothing more than trash in the end. Should have left you in the gutter. Talon was outraged and he let out a bestial cry as he lunged forward, tackling her into sofa with an audible crack, breaking the wood within. He pinned her down with his legs and started delivering elbows to her face. Blood was leaking from his mouth and her brow. It was her turn to explode now and she bucked him off her with everything she had. Talon fell over knocking a table to the side, they both lay on the ground kicking and punching at each other trying to stop the other from getting up unharassed. When they got on their knees Katerina grabbed his head and headbutted him, but that didn't work out very well for either of them, dazing them both. For a brief moment they weren't hitting each other, but Katerina went on the aggression again first and attempted to choke Talon, but his reach was longer and he was stronger. He grasped her neck as well pressing a thumb deeply into her throat and charged her into a wall. He pulled her off and slammed her against the wall a few times before she raised both her legs against his chest and pushed him off. Talon recovered quickly and leaned in to punch her but she disappeared in a flash of light, appearing behind him and Charlie horsing him. 
she attempted to break his neck but he flung her over him again and threw the table that was knocked to the side a few moments ago, smashing it. They were starting to slow down and both recovered before either could make a move. They each picked up their abandoned weapons, ready for one final cross. Hey! They heard and turned toward the direction of the voice. The next moment they found themselves strapped to chairs with their wounds being tended to by Cassiopeia. They had been disarmed of all weapons. There was a crew in the background attending to the trash they had made of the living room. After a few moments they realized that Cassiopeia had turned them both to stone then strapped them both down for their own good. Both Talon and Katerina began catching their breath. Being turned to stone didn't help respiration. I'm disappointed in both of you. Cassiopeia said in an almost motherly tone as she wringed out a bloody cloth, only to use it again seconds later on Talon. You both love him and you have your own way of showing it. A tear formed in her eye that she quickly wiped away. We need each other now, Noxus needs us now, to be strong. As we always have been, after losing Dad. Talon exhaled audibly before adding, he was a great leader. And I'm going to find him. Katerina said nothing, and no more was said between any of them while Cassiopeia tended to them and kept them separate. Later that night Talon was in his room, writing on his desk before catching some sleep. A knock was heard on his door. He didn't answer it, but it opened anyway. Hey! Katerina said through the crack she created, wearing her nightwear. Hey! Talon replied. I'm not apologizing. She said. I didn't expect you to. The light from his nearby candle giving her only the vision of the back of his head. She sighed quite loudly. I don't care if you go. You can. No, I'm going to stay. Talon's reply as quick as his blade. You were serious about what you said. Katerina queried in return. Talon stopped writing for a moment, he paused, then he held up the paper upon which he was writing. Did you know, Talon's speech interrupted by dramatic pauses, that your father taught me how to write? I came off the street illiterate. No one taught me anything. I didn't know math either. I only knew how to kill and to survive. He paused again as he set the paper down, but Katerina didn't say anything, only waiting apprehensively for his next words. He said it was unacceptable. That I was a member of House Dukuto now and it would be shameful to continue living uneducated like that. He paused again, reminiscing. So. He taught me. All of it, personally. Talon fingered a corner of the paper as he heard a click of the door behind him closing. The edge of Katerina's mouth twitched as she closed the door, pressing her back against it as it shut. She let out a sigh combined with a soft and quiet laugh, before returning to her room. LeBlanc awoke in a room that she had never been in before. It was dark but that did not largely concern her. What concerned her was the serpent woman currently coiled around her and squeezing the life from her. Talon and Katerina had ropes and a lot of experience using them to bind prisoners. Cassiopeia preferred it this way though. LeBlanc stared defiantly into Cassiopeia's eyes. Cassiopeia was few things, a manipulator and a total bitch to anyone who wasn't family and also happened to be a serpent woman. Others were tools to her and it was second nature for her to discard others like trash. This particular trash had harmed her family though and it still had its uses. Don't mind me, just enjoying your gurgles of pain. Cassiopeia laughed at LeBlanc's struggling. LeBlanc had been disarmed and without a launch pad or previous clone set up, she had no means to escape and everyone present knew it. When Cassiopeia relented enough for LeBlanc to speak she uttered more foolish words, Do you think that this paltry torture will get me to speak? Let me tell you which. LeBlanc's own words were cut off when Cassiopeia tightened her grip on her causing LeBlanc to scream out in pain. Cass thought she heard some bones break. Now, now. We can't go killing our prisoner. Yet. Talon reminded Cassiopeia as he walked out of the darkness. Clearly he had just been watching so Cassiopeia didn't kill their catch. Hey. Hey. Talon exclaimed, and he started slapping LeBlanc to catch her attention. This was when Katerina approached, who had been watching out of amusement more than anything. She backhanded LeBlanc with her knuckles, inciting an immediate response. LeBlanc sat up, looking at her captors inquisitively, a small trickle of blood escaping the corner of her mouth. Talon knew the right questions to ask, so he took charge, he grabbed a handful of hair and brought their faces within inches of each other. Spill it, or I'll spill your entrails. 
We came down to this crappy corner of Noxus because it was you who is responsible for General Marcus Ducuto's disappearance. Tell me where he is, now. Talon spat. LeBlanc merely grinned at him for a moment. Yes, I stole your precious general away. But if you want to know where he is, I cannot tell you. I don't know that information. Only Swain knows. Swain? Why Swain? Katerina interjected. Talon looked at her, he had this. Katerina shrugged in response. Talon believed LeBlanc's reply, she wasn't in a position to lie. I'm aware Swain has ties with the Black Rose. I'm trying to understand what you two stand to gain from the General's disappearance. Talon reasserted himself. He was in the way. Swain had his own reasons but the good General was constantly meddling. He was set to be the next High General. He interrupted Black Rose affairs and was opposed to the Ionian invasion. He needed to be removed and the Black Rose is the best answer for removing even the highest seats of authority from Noxus. LeBlanc replied. And what did you do with the General? Handed him to Swain's men. After that, I can't say. Was he alive when gave him away? Yes, he wanted it that way. For what? LeBlanc just stared him down. She made it apparent that she was merely services rendered for Ducuto's capture, nothing more. She had objectives fulfilled by doing so, so it was to her benefit anyway. LeBlanc just needed a backer, and she found one in Swain. Swain was, just as the Ducuto family had concluded, masterminded the whole affair. Katerina took a step up to LeBlanc and Talon released her hair and stepped aside. How did you manage to bring him in? Katerina asked. Classic misdirection, my dear LeBlanc smiled to Katerina. You were out on a mission at the time. If you remember, your return experienced... Delays. That was us. We used your delay to inform the general that we had you. You were less experienced than you are now. The only way to get him to come out was to threaten his family. Discreetly, of course. LeBlanc paused for a moment. Your father was strong. An annoyance to bring down. One void monster, several of my best mages and assassins, and my own efforts included we brought him down. That was after poisoning his drink as well. He certainly earned his title, the Blade of Noxus. LeBlanc reminisced. How did you even get to poison him? Katerina replied. Unusually simple, actually. Everyone knows he pours his own drink or has them checked, but Swain had built a report with him and drank from the same pitcher. Swain puts everything on the line to make his dreams, his plans, a reality. Katerina could have been angered they used her to get at her father, but she felt so close to reaching him she was more curious than anything. If she could get answers, it was worth the patience. Talon's patience had ended however. They had the why and the how, they just needed the where. Talon jammed his blade into Leblanc's neck suddenly, causing Cassiopeia to gasp and quickly release her. Leblanc's eyes went wide and her mouth agape. Blood spilled forth from her mouth and her eyes rolled back as her tongue lolled out. Talon pulled his blade out with a disgusting schlick noise and blood emptied itself from her neck in massive quantities. Talon swiped his blade in the air to the ground to cause most of the blood to remove itself as he walked away. Cassiopeia whimpered as they left her corpse in the abandoned building. She wanted to inject her venom and watch LeBlanc slowly succumb. Katerina stared at LeBlanc's lifeless body, going through the motions of death before she calmly took a turn and followed Cass out of there. The Ducuto family returned home and dressed their wounds. They took the time to rest and eat. When afternoon approached the following day, Katerina and Talon prepared themselves with their usual assassin gear with some extra climbing gear. They planned on scaling the walls of high command. Cassiopeia had to remain behind, her slithering body incapable of making a sheer climb. They needed someone to stay behind and make sure the manor was not abandoned anyway. Talon and Katerina left before night fell. Darkness would be upon them by the time they even reached high command. At night, they could no longer simply walk in as they would during the day being part of the Noxian military. They weren't guards and Swain would be the only one living at high command. It was a place of meeting, so not much reason for non-guards to visit. They could enter if they had an emergency, but then the place would be alerted. Notably, Swain would know they were coming on urgent matters. He would be more prepared than they wanted him even if he didn't know what they were coming for. They ascended the skull-faced mountain and continued treading, passing by all the high brass homes, until they reached the base of high command. 
from here they took to an outcropping they previously knew about that reached around the base. This led them over a cliff that was too high up to survive a fall. However, these two were expert climbers. Katerina and Talon could count the missions they went on together on one hand, but it was known that if they were sent together Noxian Command certainly wanted their target dead beyond all doubt. They rarely worked together but they had a synergy like no other. This could easily be attributed to all the training they went through together and all the times they fought each other. They came to know each other more than any brother or sister ought to. Talon's path diverged to the right. He reached up and grabbed at a piece of rock that stood out from the rest of the face. Talon would use hooks to reach handholds that would normally be unreachable while Katarina used disposable spikes, driven into the wall, that she could boost off of where there were previously no footholds. Katarina's path took her left and she soon disappeared out of sight. Talon eventually climbed up until he reached a walkway that had a solid wall separating guards and the trip of a lifetime. Unfortunately for them it meant they had to lean over to take a look at the sheer drop if they wanted to see Talon. He made sure to make no noise to give them a reason to. When Talon reached the top he deftly grabbed a guard by his collar and with a burst of strength hauled him over the edge, tossing the guard down the last flight he'll ever take. They were both Noxians but it was not like Talon had not slayed his fair share of Noxians before. As a teen before being under Marcus' command to having contracts within Noxus, it didn't affect him. The guard made a yell as he was hauled over, catching the attention of another guard who came over quickly to look. However Talon had shimmied over to the side and around the ledge. The guard passed him and he immediately hopped over silently. The guard went to the side to look over, as he did Talon ran at him from behind and shoved him over the edge with all his strength. Another yell was given, but no one would hear this one as he met the same fate as the other. Talon heard no alarm go up, so he figured his efforts were a success and that Katarina had met no trouble on the far side. By scaling they had bypassed the majority of guards, the front gate, and tons of suspicion. If they had just walked through the front, as they had the right to, when they confronted Swain there would be trouble concealing their guilt and making their escape without anyone suspecting them. Talon and Katarina walked around the outer edge of the building. Its architecture lending itself to straight edges with foreboding spikes sticking out at each end of the length of the building, reaching for the stars. Night avians perched everywhere, yet the place was immaculate. Swain always had his way with birds. Talon wondered where Swain's raven, Beatrice was. Hopefully it wouldn't alert him to their presence. That bird always unsettled Talon, it didn't feel natural. They met at the door leading inside passing the stairs that led far down that normal people would use. They were high in the air, in a city built on a mountain, on the second highest building. The next building only a scant number of steps up. Talon had never been inside and didn't care. His target was mere yards from him and less when they opened the door. Katarina picked the lock and Talon dashed inside silently. The room was large and incredibly dark inside, still not as dark as his recent trek into the cave though. The entire building was dedicated to Swain's living space. Katarina stayed by the door while Talon crept up quietly to Swain's bedside, he measured the rise and fall of Swain's chest, he confirmed him to be under the sheets before he made his move. Talon stood upright and nonchalantly sat on the edge of Swain's bed. Katarina tugged on a cord that hung from the ceiling, illuminating the living space from wall to wall. There were three of these throughout the room and many orbs that they powered throughout, creating sparse light good enough to read with. The room was filled with books mostly, and the shelves to hold them. However, also many experiments of arcane and necromantic nature, as well as one decrepit crossbow that had not seen use in a very long time. Swain's walking stick laid next to his bed in arm's reach. When the lights turned on Talon and Swain's eyes met. He wasn't asleep. He was waiting for this. Talon already knew this though, he had noticed Swain's breathing pace change when he realized Talon was in the room, but he had always suspected he knew they were going to meet like this. Swain laid comfortably in his bed, he didn't move an inch. You knew we were coming. Talon broke the silence. Yes. Swain replied in an annoyed tone. Then why didn't you run? Katarina spoke up, still across the room. That would only prove my guilt. Swain replied in kind. Then you know why we're here. Do you think you can prove your innocence? Talon said, disbelieving. My innocence? Oh ho, no. Swain raised his hands in defeat. You have me, there's nothing I can do to change your mind. Then. But we both know that killing me won't get your precious father back. Swain replied, cutting Talon off. Katarina replied by throwing a dagger that narrowly missed Swain's face and embedded itself into the wood of a shelf just past Swain and Talon. That's expensive you know. Hey. Talon's turn to cut him off. 
he gestured with the blade attached to his arm and patted it on Swain's chest barely covered by a blanket. Get to the point. Talon reached out and pulled Kat's dagger out of the wood. A testament to the craftsmanship of both items, there were hardly any splinters. Swain sighed and gestured to Talon if he could let him up. Talon stood up but he did so wary of Swain. Swain may be a cripple but he was also the High General of Noxus for a reason. He was crafty and still a powerful mage and nobody knew the full extent of his abilities yet. Swain grabbed his walking stick that barely reached up to his hip. Taking it, he hobbled over to a desk, sifted through some papers on it for a while, then giving up moved to a drawer, then another. Swain finally found what he was looking for in the second drawer down. He reached deep in and pulled out a thick scroll. Your father, dear girl, is still alive. This scroll will tell you his location, but... Swain spoke as he handed the scroll to Talon. Then what use do we have for you anymore? Katarina remarked, raising her weapons. Wait caught. This is... This is insane. Epilogue Swain stood on the balcony to his room, his hands pressed to the rails. Swain showed no effects of his earlier encounter with Talon and Katarina, but he knew, one poorly chosen word after he gave him the scroll and he'd have his throat. Talon was always a tool to Swain, but even now in safety he didn't consider having him killed. Aside from history showing that it wasn't a likely successful endeavor, killing tools was for weak-minded fools who couldn't manipulate their tools correctly. LeBlanc slinked out from the shadows. Her presence before going completely undetected, but not entirely unexpected for Swain. She was wearing an avian-inspired outfit, adorned with a mane and skirt of sheer black feathers, a dark, ornate tiara with a large purple feather plume blooming from its crest. Her skin nearly as pale as the her in the mode of Noxus. You're alive! Swain exclaimed. Talon claimed to have thrown you in the moat. He sneered. Yet another doppelganger, dear. LeBlanc wistfully replied, flicking her hair over her shoulder as she approached the guardrail to stand aside Swain. Swain, of course, never believed her death for a moment. Her death was faked like almost everything else about her, as part of the plan to divert Talon's attention. Who knew that the truth could be used for misdirection? Swain rhetorically posited. When it inflames your enemy into killing you rashly, I suppose. LeBlanc said with a smirk. LeBlanc waved her staff playfully, flaring a cantrip harmlessly into her hand. She played with it for a moment before smoldering it. Well, with your death you are able to move freely now. I suggest you be on your way now. There is still much work to be done. Indeed. LeBlanc replied, crestfallen. The last life of her cantrip died in her hands. In the blink of an eye, LeBlanc was gone, to directions unknown. Swain sighed, leaning with his elbows onto the rail, crossing his hands. He mused silently to himself. All the chips were falling on his side of the table and he still held a trump card or two. All according to plan. 